Okay, so I want to switch it up a bit here. I've been reading through and will continue to read through a lot of authors and thinkers um, that are interested in the logos, that are interested in metaphysics. Now, I read and I've studied postmodernism for most of you know, my time at university and especially after. And the postmoderns, uh, the postmodern ethic is to dismantle and and essentially get rid of metaphysics. Their idea is that there aren't any meta narrative claims. There are no essences as, as such in the world. So it's really anti Aristotle, uh, anti meta narrative, uh, anti metaphysics. But Jill Deleuze, who is a brilliant philosopher, he's hard to talk about and introduce. Um, but what he was doing was essentially a materialist metaphysics. So he was reviving metaphysics, but in a way that was looking at the scientific advancement and totalization that had occurred in the uh, mid 20th century. Um, so he, he was doing what you can essentially call a materialist metaphysics, a materialist metaphysics, or a metaphysics of science. He's interested in how identities are formed, whether they are atoms, molecules, cells, organisms, cities, states, nations. He posits that there are processes that are central to the manifestation of being, but they are not transcendent. They are imminent. What I'm going to use here, and I'm just going to read from uh, Manuel Delanda's Deleuze History and Science. I'm going to skip a bit um, from the back. We'll give us an idea here what this book is about. This is a collection of essays most published here for the first time on Jill Deleuze's idea about history and science. And here's where we get to kind of uh, the, the central key theme. Its focus is on ontological or metaphysical questions. What are the legitimate social entities that can be used in historical explanations given a materialist metaphysics? What are the legitimate inhabitants of the material world, natural and artificial, and what role should science play in determining their legitimacy? When can what can philosophy contribute to this enterprise? So Deleuze claimed that what philosophy does is it creates concepts. Um, in a book that he wrote, one of his later books, which was another co collaboration with the psychoanalyst uh, Felix Guattari, he wrote a book called What is Philosophy? In that book, he outlines uh, what he considers the, is the task of a philosopher, which is to fabricate, to, to create concepts. Um, so I'm going to start reading here um, and just kind of see how it goes. In this portion, this is a, one of the later chaps, chapters entitled Materialist Metaphysics, and it's going to introduce uh, Deleuze's idea, uh, Deleuze's ontology, and it's going to juxtapose it against Aristotle's idea of essences. So here we go. Idealists have it easy. Their reality is uniformly populated by appearances or phenomena structured by linguistic representations or social conventions. So they feel they can feel safe to engage in metaphysical speculation, knowing that the contents of their world have been settled in advance. Realists, on the other hand, are committed to assert the autonomy of reality from the human mind, but then must struggle to define what inhabits that reality. Many religious people, for example, are realists about transcendent spaces and entities like heaven and hell, angels and demons. But a materialist metaphysician can only be a realist about imminent entities, that is, entities that may not subsist without some connection to a material or energetic substratum. And while it may be simple for a materialist to get rid of angelic or demonic creatures, there are other forms of transcendence that are far more difficult to remove. So right here, just in the opening paragraph, um, we have the juxtaposition of idealism and realism and how Deleuze, again, this is Delanda, Manuel Delanda, who is a popularizer of Deleuze, is writing here and kind of setting us up where we're at. 
um, to look at the, the differences uh, uh, and the difficulties of positing a metaphysics uh, in terms of materialism. So moving on here. In particular, if material entities are to have an identity that does not depend on human consciousness, the existence and endurance of this identity must be explained. The traditional way of accounting for a stable identity is by postulating the existence of essences. Transcendent entities that have been part of a realism for more than 2,000 years and that are, here, uh, that are therefore hard to eliminate. The most defensible version of this concept is the one due to Aristotle. He defined metaphysics or ontology as a science concerning itself with the study of entities capable of separate subsistence, entities about which the most important distinction was, the, was that between those that subsist according to accident and those that subsist essentially. Metaphysics could not speculate about the accidental, so it was the second kind of entities that constituted its subject matter. As Aristotle wrote, quote, Now, if there is something that is eternal and immovable, and that involves a separate subsistence, it is evident that it is the province of the speculative, that is, of the ontological, to investigate such. It is not certainly the province of the physical science, at any rate. For physical science is conversant about certain movable natures, nor of the mathematical, but of a science prior to both of these, that is, the science of metaphysics. For physical science, I admit, is conversant about things that are inseparable, to be sure, but not immovable. And of mathematical science, some are conversant about entities that are immovable, it is true, yet perhaps not separable, but subsisting as in matter. But metaphysics for the first philosophy... Well, but metaphysics or the first philosophy is conversant about entities which both have a separate existence and are immovable, and it is necessary that causes should be eternal, all without exception. End quote. So Aristotle's world was populated by three categories of entities, genus, species, and individual. Entities belonging to the first two categories, genus, genus and species, subsisted essentially those belonging to the third one, individuals, only accidentally. The genus could be, for example, animal, the species human, and the individual, this or that particular person, characterized by contingent properties, being white, being musical, being just. A series of subdivisions in which, at every step, only logically necessary distinctions were made linked a genus and its various species, starting with the genus animal, for example, we could first subdivide it into two-footed and many-footed types. Then we could subdivide each type into differences of foot, hooves, as in, as in horses, or feet, as in humans. When this series of subdivisions reached a point at which any further distinctions were accidental, like a foot missing a toe, we arrived at the level of the species, the, spe of the, species, the lowest ontological level at which we could speak of an essence or of the very nature of a thing. As Aristotle summarized his realist ontology, quote, Physical or natural substances are acknowledged to have a subsistence. For example, fire, earth, water, air, and the rest of simple bodies. In the next place, plants and, and the parts of these animals also and their parts. And lastly, the heavens and the parts of the heaven. But unquestionably, from the foregoing reasonings, the consequence ensues of there being other substances, I mean the essence or very nature of a thing. Further, in other respects, the genus is substance in preference to the species, and the universal is to the singular. I'm going to repeat that again. So further, in other respects, the genus is substance in preference to the species, and the universal to the singular. That's the end quote here. So Aristotle is without doubt the most influential realist philosopher of all time. His, ontolo his ontological distinctions are today embedded in ordinary language. As when we say that a property is more generic or more specific than another. Replacing his metaphysics with something entirely different is therefore a major philosophical challenge. From the work of the philosopher Jill Deleuze, we can derive such a novel ontology, an approach to the problem of existence that may be called a neo-materialist metaphysics. In this approach, all actual entities are considered to be individual singularities. 
that is, all belong to the lowest level of Aristotle's ontological hierarchy, while the roles of the two upper levels are performed by universal singularities. Later in this essay, we will see that this is in fact only a rough characterization, since in some cases, such as that of humans or horses, the level of the species is replaced by an individual singularity operating at a larger scale. But for the purpose of establishing a sharp contrast to get the discussion started, it will suffice to say that the Aristotelian categories of the general and the, the particular are replaced in a Deleuzian ontology by the universal singular and the individual singular. So here's the main initial juxtaposition. I'm going to reread that again. Uh, and Deleuze uses a lot of uh, neologisms. He makes up a lot of words. He appropriates a lot of words from mathematics and physics, um, and he reuses them and repurposes them to make his distinction, to make his, uh, his ontology manifest. So, um, but for the purposes of establishing a sharp contrast to get the discussion started, it will suffice to say that the Aristotelian categories of the general and the particular are replaced in a Deleuzian ontology by the universal singular. So we have the universal singular that replaces the general and the individual singular, which replaces the particular. The terms general and universal are often used interchangeably by Aristotle or Deleuze, and they are, also, they are also near synonyms in ordinary language. So the distinction between them must be a matter of technical definition. For Aristotle, the levels of genus and species are directly linked to the logical role of predication, so that when we say, for example, that Socrates is human, the proposition derives its truth from the fact that the particular individual named Socrates belongs to a general category named human, or what amounts to the same thing that we can truly ascribe the general predicate human to the particular subject so Socrates. On the other hand, the term universal in the technical sense used here does not refer to logical predicates, but to the mathematical structure of a space of possibilities. To summarize the main distinction between the two stances, in Deleuze's own words, we may say that, the, that singularity is beyond particular propositions no less than universal, universality is beyond general propositions. I'll repeat that again. So to summarize the main distinction between the two stances and to lose his own words, we might say that singularity is beyond particular propositions, no less than universality is beyond general propositions. End quote. So he'll explain it with some examples here. Let's begin with the comparison of the two ontologies at the atomic scale. That is, with the case in which the genus is atom and the species is hydrogen or oxygen. So the general category is atom. The um, particular is the particular you know, function in, in uh, hydrogen, hydrogen or oxygen. A modern Aristotelian approach would begin by giving necessary and sufficient conditions to belong to the general category hydrogen, such as possession of a single proton and a single electron. This is a perfectly reasonable way to specify the identity of this chemical species, given that if we added another proton to a hydrogen atom, we would have, we would change its identity. Transforming it into an atom of helium. But in Aristotle, a species did not just play a role in classifying entities, but also in generating them. As a good realist, Aristotle knew that he had to explain how objective entities come into existence in both nature and art. In both cases, his explanation involved essences acting as formal causes. In nature, Aristotle saw the operation of essences as self-evident, from the observation that a horse begets a horse and a human a human. In other words, he explained how animal species generate individual organisms by saying that they formally caused them. And similarly, for art, in the case of building a house or nurturing a patient to health, the formal causes is the idea that pre-exists in the human soul. Hence, Aristotle argued that a house or any other entity that involves matter arises or is generated from that which does not involve a connection with matter. For the medicinal and the house building, arts are the form, the one of health and the other of house. Now, I mean by substance not involving any connection with matter, the essence or very nature of formal cause of a thing. This is 
a much stronger claim than simply saying that possession of a single proton and a single electron is the criterion to belong to the category. Hydrogen. It is also a claim about what is philosophically significant about the generation of form, the process through which a house is built or a horse embryologically, embryologically developed involves a connection with matter, imminent and is therefore not an important metaphysically as the formal essence that is not that is not so connected, transcendent. So there's a lot to chew on, and this is a kind of popularizing, this is a simplification of Deleuze's ideas, if you can imagine. Um, so to add a little bit here, in a Deleuzean ontology, remember ontology is the uh, study uh, of being. So in a Deleuzean ontology, on the other hand, an essence operating as a formal cause would not be what defines the identity of, of an assemblage composed of protons and electrons, nor would an essence make questions of process of assembly irrelevant to metaphysics. The minimal definition of the term assemblage is that of a whole with properties that are both irreducible and imminent. An assemblage's properties are irreducible because while they emerge from the actual interaction between its parts, they cannot be ascribed to any of its parts. And they are imminent because if the components of the assemblage cease to interact, its own properties would cease to exist. Emergent properties may not depend on this or that particular interaction, on this or that connection with matter, but they do demand that there should be some connection with matter. The emergent chemical properties and capacities of an atom, for example, depend on its outermost shell of electrons, whether the shell is missing an electron or has an extra electron or is exactly full. This property determines how many bonds an atom can form with the other atoms. Carbon atoms can form four, oxygen, oxygen ones, oxygen ones two, and hydrogen atoms only one. The properties of the outer shell and the bonding capacities with which these endow an atom are clearly not reducible to the properties of individual electrons, but they would cease to exist if those electrons stopped interacting with the atom's nucleus. We can summarize this by saying that there is no such thing as hydrogen in general. Only a very large population of individual hydrogen atoms defined by properties that emerge from the continuous interaction among individual components. In other words, each hydrogen atom is an individual singularity. So this is an important point um, of the difference between uh, or, or, or the distinction of what Deleuze means when he says individual uh, or when he says singularity, um, individual singularity. Uh, and what he was just saying here is that while you have particulars that make up um, holes, so you have individual atoms that make up hydrogen, there's nothing essential other than the, the particular form and function of the group of atoms that we call hydrogen. There's nothing essence essential in there. So there's nothing as, there's no such thing as, as hydrogen as such. Um, so, or was I here? So yeah, to, to the objection that even if each hydrogen atom is a unique historical entity, all hydrogen atoms are basically the same. They are all defined by a one proton nucleus. We can answer that there are other components, neutrons, that produce inherent variation. Depending on the number of neutrons a hydrogen nucleus possesses, variant isotopes of this chemical species are generated. Proteum, deuterium, and tritium. The number of neutrons in a nucleus has very little effect on an atom's chemical properties, but it does affect its physical stability. Some isotopes are stable and more enduring, while others decay faster. When we consider not one atom, but the entire population of atoms, the relative abundances of isotopes are more exactly that statistically form of the, distri of the distribution of isotopes, of isotopic variation. It contains information about the historical processes that produced the members of the population processes that replace formal causes in this, in this ontology. In other words, the variation is not a trivial side effect, but a significant source of knowledge. Let's briefly sketch what is known in astrophysics about the production of atoms of different species. 
Although hydrogen and helium were produced under the intense conditions following the Big Bang, the rest of the chemical species had to wait hundreds of millions of years until the form formation of stars. Today, the nuclei of most atoms are assembled in stars, so the process of assembly is known as stellar nucleosynthesis. Stars of different sizes serve as assembly factors for atoms of different species. The larger and hotter the star is, the heavier the atoms it can put together. The smaller stars, like our sun, are only hot enough, 10 million degrees Kelvin, to burn hydrogen as fuel and produce helium as a product. At higher temperatures, over 100 million degrees, helium itself can be burnt as fuel and yield as products carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen. At even higher intensities, a billion degrees, carbon and oxygen become the fuel, while the products are atoms of the species sodium, magnesium, silicon, and sulfur. As intensities continue to increase, silicon is burned as fuel to produce iron, and finally, a maximum of intensity is reached in the process of explosive nucleosynthesis, in which the heavier species are created during the violent events known as a supernova. We can imagine that confronted with this information, Aristotle would be unimpressed, since he could argue that the details of how a house is built, or a patient healed, or an atom assembled, are less important than their formal causes. In particular, he could argue that regardless of what happens in stars, only a certain number of atomic species exist, a number that can be considered to have existed prior to any process of nucleosynthesis. There is, in fact, some truth to this objection, which is why we need to add an ontology of individual singularities, the uh, we, which is why we need to add to, an, add to an ontology of individual singularities the universal singularities that structure the space of, the possible, of possible species. Let's first consider this space as given in the famous periodical ta periodic table of elements. The table itself has a colorful history because several scientists had already discerned regularities in the properties of the chemical species when ordered by atomic weight prior to Mendeleev stamping his name on the table in 1869. Several decades earlier, for example, one scientist had already seen a simple arithm arithmetical relation between triads of elements, and later on, others noticed the certain properties, like chemical reactivity, recurred every seventh or eighth element. In other words, rhythms or periodically recurrent regularities had been observed pointing to the existence of a deeper structure. What constitutes Medelib's great achievement is that he was the first one to have the courage to leave open gaps in the table instead of trying to impose an artificial closure on it. This matters because in the 1860s, only around 60 species had been isolated, so the holes in Medelev's table were like daring predictions that yet undiscovered species had to exist. He predicted, for example, the existence of germanium on the basis of the gap near silicon. The Curies later on predicted the existence of radium on the basis of its neighbor barium. These risky predictions and their eventual corroboration is what gave the table its objective status what accounts for the underlying rhythms at the chemical heart of the matter. Before giving an answer, let's take a quick look at the fields of mathematics that are relevant to the study of universal singularities. So here is going to introduce um, differential calculus, dynamical systems theories, and a lot of kind of abstract higher level mathematical ideas, which was one of the reasons I love Deleuze and uh, is that he, uh, he, brings these ideas in the form of um, philosophical questions from the realm of higher level mathematics, he is adept at bringing them into the form in, in format of language and discussing them in a way where one doesn't have to understand the technical mathematical um, you know, procedures that are done in these areas. So it's a way philosophically to um, appropriate abstract mathematical concepts and understand them in a more um, sense of uh, metaphysical, philosophical, narrative type sense. I don't know if that made any sense actually. But So before giving an answer, let's take a quick look at the fields of mathematics that are relevant to the study of universal singularities. One of them is the study of differential equations, a field known today as dynamical systems theory, and another is the field known as group theory, a field that was born from the study of algebraic equations. The ancestor of the theory of dynamical systems is a mathematical method invented by the great 18th century mathematician, Leonard Euler. 
the calculus of variations, a method that could reveal the singularities, structuring the space of possible solutions to differential equations. The singularities discovered by Euler were of a very simple type, minimum and maximum points. But the behavior of many physical systems is governed by minima or maxima of some quantity. The spherical shape of a soap bubble, for example, emerges spontaneously and recurrently because the entire population of molecules cons cons constituting a piece of soap film has the tendency to be in whatever state minimizes surface tension. The cubic shape of a crystal of ordinary table salt also emerges spontaneously and recurrently because its constituent atoms of sodium and chlorine have a tendency to minimize bonding energy. In both cases, the space of possibilities contain a singularity, a topological point that is real but need not be actual if it is not currently being manifested. I'll read that again. So in both cases, in the case of the soap bubble and in the case of the salt, the space of possibilities, what the salt and the soap bubble can look like, can be what it's... Um, uh, what type of space it can have, what type of space it can inhabit, its, its qualities, its texture. So in both cases, the space of possibilities contain a singularity, a topological point that is real but need not be actual if it is not currently being manifested. And when the singularity is actualized, it leads to the formation of a variety of geometrical forms, spheres, cubes, and many other forms. This divergent actualization is the reason why mathematical singularities are referred to as universal and not general. A general essence resembles that into which it becomes incarnated, but a universal singularity bears no resemblance to its divergent actualizations. I'll read that part again because it's important if you're following here um, to get the distinction. What's the difference between generalities and universalities? because he's looking here to um, differentiate between general and universal. So this divergent actualization is the reason why mathematical singularities are referred to as universal and not general. A general essence resembles that into which it becomes incarnated. So you can think of a general essence of a human. A human is going to give birth to another human. It's not going to give birth to you know, a different type of animal. Um, but in, math in a mathematical sense, um, there is a much more kind of sophisticated process that uh, is not real. It's not actual. That is real, but is not actual. Um, that is going on here to kind of explain the universal. And this probably is very, very confusing if you're not familiar with, with Deleuze because he, the concepts that he uh, brings forth, actual, virtual, um, individual, universal, singularities, they're kind of assumed here a little bit. So, The discovery of the first singularities, simple as they were, was enough to provoke in Euler and his contemporaries the sense that they had revealed something about the divine plan. For how else, they thought, would a rational God organize his creation but by making the most efficient use of all materials, that is, by minimizing or maximizing? Today we do not take such a theological musing seriously, but Euler's other insights are still valid. In particular, he thought of his discovery in Aristotelian terminology calling singularities final causes because they represent long-term tendencies, that is, the final end towards which a process tends. And these final causes, Euler argued, did not replace the study of mechanisms, that is, of processes involving efficient causes, but rather complemented it. In other words, explaining the emergence of a bubble or a crystal involves both elucidating the different mechanisms that produce these forms, efficient causes, as well as de determining the me mechanism-independent tendencies common to both forms, final causes. Euler's powerful insights on the structure of sets of possibilities were given an explicit spatial expression towards the end of the 19th century by another great mathematician, Henri Poincaré. Poincaré created the notion of phase space to study the space of possible solutions to nonlinear differential equations and discovered new types of singularities as recurrent features of these spaces, different types of point singularities, steady state attractors, line singularities in the form of closed loops, periodic attractors, and even glimpsed the existence of fractal singularities, chaotic attractors. Like the original singularities, these different attractors represented the long-term tendencies of a process, the tendency toward a steady state, the tendency toward a simple rhythmic state, and the tendency towards a complex but stable rhythmic state. 
Although the ideas of Poincaré took decades to propagate outside of mathematics, by the 1960s they were in the air in cities like Paris. Gilles Deleuze was not only able to immediately grasp their significance, but also possessed them possessed enough technical background to quickly adapt them for the formulation of metaphysical problems. In particular, he realized that universal singularities structure not only formal possibility spaces, spaces of possible solutions for equations, but also the possibility spaces associated with real entities, like bubbles or crystals. Deleuze also realized that there were other mathematical fields besides the differential calculus that could, use, that could be used to reveal such structure, fields like group theory. So that's a really important point to, that kind of drives home um, what was happening in the 50s and 60s when Deleuze was writing his ontology here, what was happening in high-level uh, abstract mathematics, and how Deleuze was able to appropriate high-level abstract mathematics and apply it to real organisms, real being itself. That's what his metaphysics and his ontology essentially is. It's the appropriation of the advances of abstract mathematics into the realm of philosophy. philosophy. So he's creating concepts by borrowing from the field of mathematics. Now, for Deleuze, borrowing from different fields and assembling uh, different um, particular individuals from different fields, whether it's art, literature, philosophy, mathematics, science, and creating new emergent concepts, philosophical concepts, is essentially his project. Um, so let me read this part again. So. So Gilles Deleuze was not only be, not only immediately able to grasp their significance of um, of mathematics that were being discussed in the '60s, but also possible enough, also possessed enough technical background to quickly adapt them from the formulation of of metaphysical problems. In particular, he realized that universal singularity structure, not only formal not only formal possibility spaces spaces of possible solutions for equations the mathematical space where mathematical equations are uh, function, but also the possibility spaces associated with real entities like bubbles or crystals. Deleuze also realized that there were other mathematical fields beside the differential calculus that could be used to reveal such structure, the fields like group theory. Um, this is what he's going to kind of get into next here. I've been kind of going for 30 minutes. I don't know how many folks are still slugging along here. So group theory was born from the study of the space of possible solutions to algebraic equations, but it eventually grew into an autonomous discipl discipline concerned with the study of symmetry. Let's illustrate this using a soap bubble and a salt crystal. The salt crystal has the form of a cube, a figure that remains invariant if we rotate it by 0, 90, 180, or 270 degrees, in the sense that if an audience did not witness the performance of the rotation, they would not notice that there has been any change. The sphere formed by the bubble, on the other hand, remains invariant under a much larger number of rotations, 0, 1, 2, 3, 359 degrees. In group theory, this is expressed by saying that a sphere has more rotational symmetry than a cube. A related concept is that of a symmetry-breaking transition, a transformation that yields a figure with less symmetry. If we constrain a piece of soap film so that it cannot form a sphere, it can nevertheless manifest its tendency to minimize surface tension by forming a saddle-shaped surface, a, hyperbo a hyperbolic paraboloid, that has less symmetry. In other words, group theory can allow us to study not only the tendency to generate a particular form, but also the tendency to generate a family of such forms, each with a decreasing, de decreasing degree of symmetry. An example of a cascade of broken symmetries generating a family of forms starts with a sphere that lo loses symmetry to become a two-lobed figure. That in turn loses more symmetry and becomes a four-lobed figure. That finally becomes an even less symmetric six-lobed figure. So you can uh, visualize this if you see a soap bubble, whether you're washing the dishes in the soap bubble as it breaks down, uh, it breaks down from a perfect sphere to kind of a saddle-shaped two-dimensional figure, and then it kind of bifurcates and differentiates back down in, in, these certain, um, in these certain ways that group theory can uh, identify and predict. 
So armed with this terminology, we can now confront the question of what would replace the genus Adam in a Deleuzian metaphysics. The structure of the genus, the way it subdivides into species, is given by the rhythms of the periodic table. The first rhythm to be noticed, as mentioned before, was that the emergent properties of atoms recurred every eight spaces, species. Later on, however, as more species were discovered, chemists realized that the rhythm was more complex than that. It repeated twice with a cycle of eight, then it repeated twice more with a cycle of 18, then twice more with a cycle of 32. Adding this, the lone simplest species, hydrogen and helium, the series became becomes 2, 8, 8, 18, 18, 32, 32. The explanation for this complex periodicity turned out to be the, the asymmetry breaking cascade in the shape of the trajectories with which an electron orbits the nucleus. Actually, electrons do not move along sharply defined trajectories since they behave like waves, but rather inhabit a cloud or statistical distribution possessing a given spatial form, an orbital. I'm going to skip a little bit here. Let's summarize the argument so far. In a Deleuzean ontology, there's no such thing as, an, as atoms in general, only variable populations of individual atomic assemblages. The kind and number of some components of the assemblage, protons, is what ensures that some properties are shaped by all atoms of a given species, while the kind and number of others, neutrons, give these properties a certain degree of variation. Some variants of the assemblage will be highly stable isotopes, like the isotope of helium possessing exactly two protons and two neutrons, while other variants will lack this property. Only isotopes that are very stable last long enough in the intense environment of a star to serve as a platform for the assembly of more complex nuclei. This means that while the different species of atomic assemblages are defined by the structure of the space of possible electron or orbitals, the production pathways from one species to the other with a star or det are determined by populations of stable isotopes, a stability derived from the possession of a singularity, a minimum of energy, in the space of possible proton-neutron interactions. Thus, an atomic assemblage has an actual part, the components that actually interact to yield emergent properties, and a virtual part, the universal singularities and symmetries that structure its associated possibility space. The term virtual refers to the ontological status of entities that are real but not actual, such as tendencies that are not actually manifested or capacities that are not actually exercised. The virtual component of an assemblage is called its diagram. All right, I'm going to stop for now. Um, and please, if you're listening by this point, let me know what you think. Let me know if you would like me to continue down uh, this path at all. Thanks for listening.